Good morning. And welcome to worship on this 32nd Sunday of Ordinary Time. We're almost out of Ordinary Time. Advent will be starting soon. Let's pay attention to the announcements. We have a lots of announcements today. First of all, session members, remember our regular monthly meeting will be following worship. Also, I doubt that anyone planned to attend, but this afternoon the stated clerk of the National of the, uh, Presbyterian Church USA was to be speaking in Huntsville at uh, Faith Presbyterian Church. He, that has been canceled. Uh, his wife is critically ill and uh, in the hospital, and so that will not be happening. Um, but what will be happening is uh, our mission of the month is still safe place, our local counseling service and shelter for domestic violence. And so if you wish to make a contribution to that, put an extra check in the offering plate and put safe place on it. Remember, if you have not signed up for your picture to be taken for the pictorial directory, whether you're a member or a friend of the church, you need to do that soon back in the Narthex. Ladies, you are meeting this Wednesday evening. So uh, at 6 o'clock, Fellowship Hall, so be aware of that. Is anything anybody wants to say about that, that what's happening or anything? No? Okay. And then next week, remember, we will have a, one of our two stated congregational meetings of the year. Uh, the only business at this meeting will be to select two members for the nominating committee to select session members for the next year. Uh, there will be, uh, the uh, session has chosen Harriet Bostic as the session representative on the nominating committee. The congregation will select two others. Uh, the Book of Order requires diversity, so that means at least one of those two must be a man. And ideally, it would be nice if one of them were, say, over 50 and one under 50. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, whatever age you want to choose, Mike, I don't know. Uh, you, you, would be, you would be the under 80. I mean, under 80. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I blew that, so let's just move on. Um, I wouldn't be under 50 either. <laughs> Um, also notice that we, are have, we have to eat on the 24th, so be sure that's on your calendar and plan to be here for that. Um, also, of course, in terms of celebration, tomorrow is Veterans Day. So let's take a moment to recognize our veterans. If you are a veteran of any of the military services, would you stand for a moment, please, so we can acknowledge you? And then the rest of us... You anticipated what I was going to say, so I don't need to say it. Thank you on behalf of all of us for your service and for the sacrifices. Uh, even if uh, just being in the service is sacrificing a lot of time that could have been spent otherwise. So we appreciate your sacrifice and service. Now, I believe I have said everything I need to say. Is there anything else that needs to be said? Any other celebrations or announcements that... Uh, I don't know about. Jeremiah said, it is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Some of us have come here needing some kind of saving. Well, I suspect all of us need saving of one sort or another. We may not always be aware of it. So let's be quiet for a moment and wait for the salvation of the Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us worship. If you are able, please stand with me for our call to worship. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. God is near to all of us. Come. Let us praise God who walks with us daily. Amen. And so we will continue our worship in song. Please remain standing. We'll turn to page 463, Rock of Ages. And we'll sing all three verses.
If you care to, please join me as in our prayer of confession as we pray together in unison saying, Faithful God, we come before you with many issues on our hearts. We get frustrated and angry at the way things are going in the world. We want your immediate intervention, and when we don't see things happening the way we think they should be, we are quick to dismiss you and any thought of your presence. Help us stop our selfishness and our quick anger. Remind us that you will work with us and through us for peace and hope. Release us from the traps of quick tests of your faithfulness and help us see the big picture of your awesome love that spans all of time. Forgive us for our pettiness and our stubbornness. Bring us back to you, O Lord. Help us shout your praises and live lives of joyful service for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we continue with our silent and personal prayers of confession. By the authority of the one who is yesterday, today, and forever, all of our sins, misdeeds, failures, and mistakes are forgiven. And so we can continue rejoicing in song. Since today is Veterans Day, um, you know, we live in a flawed country. Its imperfections are, it has gross imperfections, but it's still the model for the world and we are very fortunate that uh, we were born or we came to this country to live so with all its imperfection it is still home and it is still a shining beacon for God so we thought we would honor our veterans who give so much to protect that and let Donnie play the uh, national anthem there's an American flag right here if you'd like to stand and, and uh, join us as we salute this country and our veterans
What an honor it is to be in this country, be in this church, and be up here with these folks up here. Just like with this country, we are all imperfect, and we all need things sometimes. We need to ask for help. And too often we forget to go to the source that we know is there for us always. All we need to do is praise his name.
Donald? Yes. Remember your dare. You know, you know how you, you get on to me for crying? I got to get on to Paisley now. <laughs> oh. I just can't see my words. <laughs> <laughs> we should all be so blessed as to have the heart you've got, Nani. <laughs> uh, maybe I should have been an actor. <laughs> Y'all give Ashley another hand. She does oh, such a beautiful, beautiful job. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore And the roll is called up yonder I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll Yonder, when the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of His resurrection share, when His chosen one shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the road is called up yonder 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 I'll be there Let us labor for the Master from dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all His wondrous love and care. Then when all this life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll called up yonder when the road is called up yonder I'll be there when the road when the road is called up yonder when the road when the road is called up yonder when the road when the road is called up yonder when the road is called up yonder I'll be there Thank you, Jim, uh, Ashley, Mitch, Donnie, Donna Kay. I almost forgot you, Donna Kay. That would be a, no, it would be, be a terrible thing to do. But as long as Jim doesn't forget you, that's the main thing, right? Okay. Let's turn our attention to our lectionary readings for the day, for this 32nd Sunday of Ordinary Time. Psalm 145 is our psalm of praise. 
and we're just going to read the first five verses of it. Um, the latter part of this psalm, it's believed, inspired the doxology for the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but we're, we don't need to, we're not going to concern ourselves with that right now. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever, every day. I will bless you, not just on Sunday, but every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. That's meaningful for us when we meet in this historic building that has seen so many generations come and go. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. And then our Old Testament reading from Haggai, chapter 1, verses two, uh, uh, 5 to chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, Haggai, again, is a prophet whom we know nothing about, except it's obvious that he prophesied, lived at the time after the exile, when the exiles had returned. The temple is still fundamentally in ruins. Uh, the progress on rebuilding it is very slow. And Haggai feels led to motivate people to inspire uh, those living in Jerusalem to get with it and get this temple rebuilt. So that's the context we're looking at. Chapter 1, verse 5. Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And you that earn wages, earn wages to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider how you have fared. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that is the temple so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You have looked for much, and though it came to little, and when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because my house lies in ruins. Will all of you hurry off to your own houses? Therefore the heavens above you have, have, above, therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the soil produces, on human beings and animals, and on all their labors. Then Serubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of the prophet Haggai, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Serubbabel was the political, the... Um, a ruler of Judea under the um, Assyrians at this time, or the Babylonians rather. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. On the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of King Darius, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? Many of those would already have died that previous generation. How does it look to you now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? Yet now take courage, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Take courage, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the promise that I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit abides among you, do not fear. That's a promise for all of us, isn't it? My spirit abides among you, do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once again in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations, 
so that the treasure of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. And of course, the, pro the temple as it was in the time of Jesus was much greater than the temple that Solomon had built. Our epistle reading from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, Thessalonica, town in Macedonia, north of Greece. This is uh, the... The first and second Thessalonians are the oldest parts of our New Testament. They were the, the first recorded, the first letter of Paul that we have that has survived. And so we're reading some very early Christian documents here. And in the first verses, Paul is dealing with an issue that seemed to have plagued the Thessalonians, misunderstanding about the coming of Christ. As to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with him, we beg you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as though from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord is already here. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the lawless one is revealed, the one destined for destruction." He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Do you not remember that I told you these things when I was still with you? And then we'll drop down to verse 13. But we must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits for salvation, through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. For this purpose he called you through our proclamation of the good news, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work, and word. And then our gospel reading from Luke's gospel, chapter 20, um, verses 27 to 38. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless, then the second and the third married her, and so in the same way all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, Whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. <coughs> Excuse me. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God not of the dead, but of the living, for to him all of them are alive. Let's acknowledge up front that this passage demands that we think about death and life after death. And so, for some of us here, it may awaken grief, latent grief. For others, it may sharpen the grief of those who may be grieving actively. Uh, but everything is going to be permeated with hope. Death is a fact of life. But it also is also something in the Christian context permeated with hope. It may be that some of our veterans here remember comrades that they lost in the line of duty. Many of you know that I do grief counseling and educational programs about loss and grief. And over the years, 
I've asked many, many people, what has helped you the most in your grief? And the most common answer is faith and family. Faith and family, those are the critical things. Faith is critical to surviving grief. And I've likewise asked many people, this talk about heaven or life after death, resurrection, eternal life, whatever word you want to use, does that make a difference? And invariably, people say yes. I've never had someone say no, it doesn't make a difference. And so remember Paul said to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4.13, he said, do not grieve as those who have no hope. He did not say do not grieve, that would be impossible. He said do not grieve as those who have no hope. Let your grief be touched with hope, be permeated with hope. And so the tears are tempered by the hope of life after death, the hope of heaven, the hope of resurrection. Escape from death is an age old quest of humanity. The problem of death, the mystery of death, has existed since the beginning of the human species. The oldest story in the world, the story of Gilgamesh, written on stone tablets 5,000 years ago in ancient Sumer in what is now southern Iraq. That story is about death. Why must people die? It's about the horror of death. Why must people die? Is there any way to avoid it? Or is there any way to get life back after death has occurred? Paleolithic grave sites, people who lived long ago, often contain artifacts suggesting a belief that uh, in the afterlife that people would need whatever it is was buried with them. Although I might mention that uh, I used to tell my history classes that um, uh, regardless, be careful of what you read, that without verbal interpretation, it's always a little bit, it's always an educated guess interpreting artifacts. Now in the case of Egypt, for example, we have tombs and artifacts. Of course, we have written interpretation that goes with all of that. But I tell, would tell them the story of, uh, I um, was at a, a funeral once of a teenage young man. Before the casket was closed, his father slipped a $20 bill into his grandson's coat pocket. Now, because he was always giving him $20 bills, it's something that he did. Now, I would tell my class, I can imagine 3,000 years from now, somebody exhuming that casket and say, see, people in America in the 20th century thought you needed money in the afterlife. Well, of course, that wasn't the case at all. It was simply a gesture of affection that was meaningful to the grandfather. So you have to be careful how you interpret something where you don't have a written, any written guide to the interpretation. In any case, the need to escape death, the need for something that transcends death is part of the great spiritual needs of humanity. We have a number of spiritual needs and one of them is what the theologians would call the need for transcendence. We all need something that will lift us beyond ourselves, take us out of ourselves, and that includes something that lifts us beyond the reality of death. And so in this passage, we have Jesus' answer to the question, is there life after death? Let's talk about the historical background here, which would be useful any time which we read our Gospels or the New Testament, especially Acts. There has never been a monolithic Judaism any more than there has ever been a monolithic Christianity. In modern Judaism, for example, there are Reformed Jews, there are conservative Jews, Orthodox Jews, and ultra-Orthodox Jews. And in first century Palestine, there were various factions or sects of Judaism as well. A couple weeks ago, we met a Pharisee in the story Jesus told about the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisees were a group, small group, probably never numbering more than 5,000, who began uh, in the time after the exile, um, who were, well, Pharisee means separated one. They tried to separate themselves from everybody else and meticulously obey every detail of the law. And we read in the Gospels, Jesus had many encounters with the Pharisees and their legalism. Then there were the zealots, the ultranationalists, those who, uh, who uh, thought the Jews should rebel against the Roman occupation. 
They will eventually recruit enough numbers that in the year 66 they will rebel and seize power and kick the Romans out. But of course the Roman Empire will strike back and in that bloody four-year Jewish-Roman war uh, the Jewish rebellion will be suppressed, the city of Jerusalem destroyed, and that magnificent Jewish temple totally destroyed. Then there were the Essenes, who were a people who said, a plague on all your houses. Uh, they went off into the desert to live a kind of monastic existence, seeking to, I uh, thought that was the only way they could live a holy life, was to be totally separated from all you sinners out there, and we'll live this holy life doing our own thing out in the desert. And then there were the Sadducees, who are featured in this passage. The Sadducees were also a somewhat small group. They were of priestly ancestry mostly. They controlled the temple and the temple complex, which is no small uh, financial enterprise, you understand, in first century Palestine. They were also collaborators with the Romans. They cooperated with the Romans and helped to administer Roman law and in part to maintain their privileged position and their position of power. Now the Sadducees, as this passage says, the Pharisees accepted uh, all of what we would know as the Old Testament as canonical scripture, as the authoritative word of God. The Sadducees were conservatives. <clears throat> They said only the law of Moses, what we call the Pentateuch, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, only that is authoritative scripture. The rest of it, the words of the prophets, the Psalms, that's somebody's interpretation, that is not the word of God. And they found no warrant for a belief in resurrection, which the Pharisees believed in. And so they said, there's no such thing as life after death, there is no resurrection. This life is all there is. Uh, this was a sharp point of debate between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Paul uh, took advantage of it in Acts 23. Some of you will remember Paul's trial before the Roman governor. And he was aware that there were both Sadducees and Pharisees. And so he said, the reason I'm on trial is because of belief in the resurrection. Well, that immediately... Uh, uh, Jews have a reputation, they would, Jews would say themselves that uh, if you have ten Jews, you have ten different opinions, and they love arguing. And we're told in Acts 23, immediately uh, conflict w broke out, Jew the Pharisees and Sadducees began arguing with one another, very clever on Paul's part. He knew where, the, where to push the button and to get these two factions arguing with one another. So that's the historical background. And Jesus says, you Sadducees are wrong, because in the story of the burning bush in Exodus, uh, it says, God says, I am the God of Abraham and of, of Isaac and of Jacob. And that means, that present tense means that he is still the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. They are still alive. Now, Jesus used rabbinic reasoning and logic that was meaningful to the teachers of those days that might not be convincing to the modern mind. But Barclay, William Barclay draws a lesson from that and points out that Jesus spoke in a way that was meaningful to his hearers. He spoke in a way that was convincing to his hearers. And there's a lesson for us in the 21st century that we need to speak in a way, we need to communicate the gospel in a way that speaks to the needs and to the thought patterns of our generation, the people around us. Now let me tell you, that's hard. That requires being informed. It requires paying attention. It requires listening. It requires being creative. It is not easy. But we in the church cannot just speak in the, well, like we, we have, uh, like uh, every profession has its own lingo, right? If you've ever tried to talk to an engineer, you quickly become aware that before long you have no idea what they're talking about. The same thing is true of the medical profession. One of the things people complain about, a nurse practitioner comes in and they, and they use words that the patient doesn't understand, have no idea, and they don't want to admit it. 
but they really have no idea what they're talking about. Well, likewise, we in the church, we use words like justification and sanctification or spiritual or even pastoral. And people out, it makes sense to us, but people outside the church, they have no idea what we're talking about. We might as well speak, be speaking French or something. They have no idea what we're talking about. And so this, uh, there's a lesson here that we need to, be, to learn how to speak to the needs of our, I, I read once, um, I haven't done this for a while, suggesting that if we want to communicate the gospel, we need to pay a lot of attention to commercials and ads. Why? Because corporations have spent hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars on psychological and marketing research to identify what the felt needs are that people have. And those, adver those ads are targeted towards people's felt needs. So if you want to know what the felt needs of people are in, in America in 2019, read the ads. Listen to the commercials thoughtfully and ask, so what is this saying about what the felt needs of people are? What are they wanting? And then how can I speak the gospel in a way that communicates to them? And that's not easy. So the, our first lesson is speak in a way, speak the gospel, speak the Christian message in a way that people can understand. And that's a challenge. Lesson two, eternal life is not just an endless quantity of life, but it is a different quality of life. We see that especially in John's gospel, throughout John's gospel. John speaks of eternal life as something that begins in the here and now. And it's a different quality of life. For example, John 17, 3 uh, says, Eternal life is to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So eternal life is not just endless duration. It's a with God life that begins in the here and now and continues into eternity. Eternal life is to know you, the only true God. So if you know God, you already have eternal life. It's already begun. It's a different quality of life. It's a with God life. So and G the way Jesus puts it in this passage, all are alive to God. There's nobody dead with God. All are alive to God. Paul says something similar in Romans 14, maybe worth our looking at. Romans 14, verses 7 through 9, he says, We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. There's no such thing as some lone wolf Christian isolated out there. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then... Whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. And then there's that beautiful passage in Revelation, which has inspired, comforted so many, many people. Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 through 4, quoting Isaiah, actually. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, that is God's throne, saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. Notice how that's worded. Not they will dwell with him, but he will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He, personally, will wipe every tear from their eyes. That has comforted so many people for so many years. God himself will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. That's the with God life. And so Paul, we won't read the passage, but some of us know 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul goes to great lengths to explain what the resurrection body is like. Jesus' body was different when he was resurrected. It was not just a resuscitation of his body as it was, but it was a transformed body. And so uh, Paul goes to great lengths to explain that um, 
uh, the resurrection body will be adapted to the circumstances of uh, the resurrection. But that does make a point. In a few minutes we'll recite the Apostles' Creed and we will say, we believe in the resurrection of the body. What does that mean? Well, it means the survival of the personality. It doesn't mean we are just absorbed into the, some uh, great spirit as some am uh, amorphous being, but Donnie will continue to be Donnie. But he won't be crying, Jim. Because we're told that God will wipe every tear from his eye. There's something to look forward to, Donnie. <laughs> it's, I'm glad you sit there in the front. That, was, I, that, that is not in my notes. That just was just inspiration that came. So to say I believe in the resur resur resurrection of the body means we're not just disembodied spirits of some sort. But we have a transformed body. And it means that bodies matter. You know, Paul said to the Corinthians uh, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Bodies matter. And the body will be transformed, different. 1 John 3.3 3 says, we will, be, we will be like Him, that is like Christ, because we will see Him as He is. And so seeing the transformed, resurrected Jesus will transform us into something like Him. That is what the New Testament says. So eternal life is a with God life that begins in the here and now and comes to fulfillment in eternity. It's impossible, of course, for us to grasp or understand what that life might be like. It's pointless to try. Alan Culpepper draws an analogy. He points out that a child cannot understand the complexities or the pleasures of adulthood. From a child's point of view, why would you want to sit on a porch on a summer's evening telling stories when you could be out chasing fireflies? That makes no sense to a child. I, it would certainly make no sense. To, you know, I just spent days with my grandsons. They would have no interest in sitting on a porch chatting they would be out chasing the fireflies, right? And it would be impossible for them to, why would anybody want to do something so boring as listening to Jim Seals tell stories? What would be the, what would be the point of that, right? When you could be running all over the yard and uh, having a good time. It's just as a child cannot understand what it is to be an adult. So it would be impossible for us to understand the life of the age to come. That's the point that is being made there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 says, you know, Paul says, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I acted like a child when I became an adult. I put away childish things. I changed. I was different with different interests. And so eternal life is a different quality of life. And then finally, our last uh, lesson from this passage, we are people of the resurrection. We are people of the resurrection. That is why we are here, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We cannot prove by reason or by evidence life after death. No matter how many stories we might hear of near-death experiences, they do not prove anything. We believe because of the resurrection of Christ and because we continue to experience his living presence. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, I delivered to you what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and on the third day he rose from the dead according to the scriptures. That's the fundamental creed that Paul presents to the Corinthians. And so we witness to the resurrection. We don't we, we don't argue for the resurrection. We witness to the resurrection. The, we, in the Apostles' Creed, we will bear witness to the resurrection. Uh, Jesus, on the third day, Christ, Jesus arose from the dead and descended into heaven, we will say. And so the witness of the church is that Christ died and Christ rose. And that we experience, we the church experience his living presence. And we hope to share in that presence. The Catholic Funeral Mass says, life is not ended, merely changed. And that is the belief of all the church. 
Life is not ended, it is merely changed. Years ago, when I was a hospice chaplain, I was with a middle-aged man who was holding in his arms the withered, lifeless body of his aged father. And he looked at me and said, is this all there is? Is this what it comes down to? Is this all there is? Well, the answer of the church is, our answer is, no. It is not all there is. We affirm with the apostles. We affirm with the writers of the New Testament. We affirm with the writers of the Apostles' Creed. We affirm with all the church through the ages the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. And we affirm with Jesus, as the church has for 2,000 years, all are alive to God. All are alive to God. Those for whom our hearts have broken. Those whom we miss most dearly. Are not dead. They are simply changed. <clears throat> All are alive to God, Jesus said. And that we believe, to that we bear witness. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now would you stand with me? We've been talking, or I've been talking, about the Apostles' Creed. You've been listening. It's your chance now to affirm your faith. Uh, the Apostles' Creed, if you need to look at it, it's printed on the back side of our worship folder. And we repeat this creed every week to remind ourselves of what we believe. Just as alcoholics repeat the 12 steps every time they meet. So we affirm the Apostles' Creed to remind ourselves of what we believe and to bear witness to what we believe. So if you care to, join with me as we recite together this ancient creed saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead and descended into heaven. There he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Excuse me, and we will turn our attention to our prayer concerns. And as usual, we have quite a long list, if I can get it picked up. There we go. We want to remember our veterans today, uh, both giving thanks for them, and there, of course there are many veterans, not not here in our congregation, but there are many veterans struggling with all kinds. You know, the suicide rate among veterans is a re, a horribly high. I think that's the only word, horribly high. Uh, so there are many veterans, uh, wounded veterans, veterans struggling with physical injuries and struggling with serious mental injuries. So we want to remember them. We always pray for North Alabama Presbytery. We pray for our session that's meeting today. We pray for the staff and residents of Safe Place, the opioid and suicide epidemic. We want to continue remembering fires continue in California and in Australia, very bad fires. We pray about the fire situation, the healing of hate, prejudice, and violence, the homeless and displaced, and then cancer patients. I'll just read the first names, Frank, Phyllis, Sadie, Jennifer, uh, Jan, Harlow, Paula. Oh, Wanda did say that uh, her friend Paula Owens is um, beginning tre uh, 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 experimental treatments at MD Anderson in Houston this next week, so she's entering a critical phase with her cancer. Uh, Doug, Randy, uh, Martha, Nicole, Wayne, Sita, Biles, and Katie will remember all of those. Uh, Debbie Bradford says that Cole Kelly, the nine-year-old with a Merrill uh, bone marrow transplant is still about the same. So we'll continue praying for him. We always pray for Tom's son, Bob Bilstein, for Joyce Ann, who uh, Katie says is basically bedfast now, Doesn't, is not able to get out of bed 
Did I just say Katie or did I say Kitty? What did I say? What? I did say Katie? Well, Katie didn't say anything about Joyce Ann, <laughs> uh, but Kitty did. My daughter-in-law must be on my mind. Uh, Valerie, of course, appreciates her always praying for her and her MS and her brother Mark, Terry Mitchell, we continue to pray for. Uh, Charlie Frost, Tom Weideman, uh, the Davenport children, their genetic problems, Dodie and her husband with dementia. Uh, let's continue to remember the Bowles family. I know Emily's grandfather died last week. The funeral was here last Sunday. Scott Gravely is going through some medical tests. Uh, Ronnie Azell, Drew Davis, Beverly Watson with ALS, Billy Carpenter. And Heather has asked us to remember a two-year-old um, friend of her, the father is a friend. Hagen Kate Bond is two and in critical care at the Children's Hospital in Birmingham. I don't know the diagnosis, but we will continue. We will pray for her. All right. Does anyone have an update or anything you want to add to this list? Yes, Mike. Karen Bolger. Karen Bolger. Okay. She's cancer, okay. Okay. Let's take a few moments for silent prayer, then I will group these together, say them aloud. And together we will say, Lord, have mercy. Then we will I will lead us in prayer and we'll conclude our prayer time with the Lord's Prayer using the debts and debtors version. Let's bow for a few moments of prayer. Together now before God, we remember together all veterans, the North Alabama Presbytery, our session, the staff and residents of Safe Place, the opioid and suicide epidemic, fires, uh, hate and prejudice and violence, the homeless and displaced. And we remember before God our cancer patients, Frank, Phyllis, Sadie, Jennifer, Jan, Harlow, Paula, Doug, Randy, Martha, Wayne, Sita, Biles, Katie, and Karen. And we remember Cole Kelly, Bob Bilstein, Joyce Ann Robbins, Valerie Richardson and her brother Mark, Terry Mitchell, Charlie Frost, Tom Weideman, the Davenport children, Dodie and her husband, the Bowles family, Scott Gravely, Ronnie Azell, Drew Davis, Beverly Watson, Billy Carpenter, and Hagen Kate Bond and her family. And now, Father, together we would collect all of these individual requests, the ones we've named aloud, but also the ones that only you have heard, the ones that we have spoken silently in our hearts. Together, we would collect them all and hold them before you. We remember before you all of these people, and we remember their needs. Some of their needs are very critical, and we remember them before you. And we would ask that you would touch each one with your loving presence, especially every point of pain, whatever the nature of the pain. We ask that you would touch every point of pain with your loving presence and that you would meet each of these people and each of us in this room, that you would meet in the week ahead at whatever our greatest need may be. So we entrust your loving care, all those for whom we care and pray, as we pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue our worship by receiving our tithes and offerings.
please stand for the doxology. trust these gifts now to our Lord's keeping and guidance. The great 20th century theologian Karl Barth, who wrote many volumes of theology and biblical exposition, was once asked if he could summarize all of his theology in one sentence. And he said, yes, I can. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Page 652, and we will sing the first and last verses. And also, Brother Carl, I meant to uh, ask you to put a dear friend of ours in the most shows mu music community lost his life last night, Jay Stoltz and his family. So we ask that you be in prayer for him. By the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may we live lives of such hope that our lives will bring glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the one who reigns with them in highest heaven, one God, blessed forever and ever. Amen.